So, you know, just to evoke another huge kind of umbrella term that a lot of people take issue with, in looking at the West, you know, kind of as a block and as a very complicated entity, I was wondering what you made of the global South as an entity, like, and how useful you find that concept as a kind of a, an alternative position from which to look at the West. Well, that's a wonderful point because it's it's a, a term that's gained a lot of currency. People keep talking about the global south, and I think it can be easier for Westerners who don't have too much experience of the non-Western world to fall back on that. But I'm sure the pair of you will agree with me, given you know where you're from and where you're living. Speaking personally, my heritage is Indian from Punjab, pre-partition. My parents are actually born in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and I was brought up in the UK, but I've been living in Singapore for the last four years. So when I think of India. Kenya, Tanzania, and Singapore, countries I have direct experience or connections or family connections or ethnic connections to, they're so different that there's no way that you could sort of collaboratively uh, push them together into this term global south. Where I do think the term does have some benefit is that many of these so-called global south countries, which by the way are all at different stages of economic development, clearly Singapore is so far stratospherically ahead of somewhere like Tanzania, they, they, how could, you couldn't possibly put them together. I think they all gained independence, mainly from European empires, but sometimes also from the US, like the Philippines, around the same time. So middle of the 20th century, 1960s, maybe sort of 70s, 80s, thinking about Zimbabwe. And I think those shared experiences mean that sometimes when you get people from those countries interacting with each other, talking to each other, discussing world affairs with each other, even if they're not talking about colonialism, they know that their countries are similarly aged as independent entities, have faced the challenges of the Cold War, problems exported from Europe to their doorsteps, have sort of followed in the footsteps of the Europeans and the US in terms of economic advancement, have sometimes been lectured to or censured by those Western countries, and are now at the cusp of a very different era. But beyond those generalizations, honestly, I don't think there's a great deal you could clump together about the global south, I think. Kobus, just to pick up on that, one of the themes that you said that binds the global south together is the shared trauma and subjugation of colonialism that they all experienced for the most part. That's what unites them in many respects is this history of, as Samir said, of being lectured and being colonized and being occupied at one point in their history. And that is a, a very powerful unifying force. It is. But I mean, you know, kind of that narrative also informs the founding stories of the United States itself. For me, I think it's that, but more specifically, the way that these countries in the process of colonization and in the first place, how the process of colonization inserted them into certain structural positions in relation to the global economy, but also how it's inserted them into a certain symbolic position in relation to development or underdevelopment. And for a lot of them, it, that meant simply like semi-permanent, like long-term underdevelopment. But even in the case of Singapore, it's still a situation of having been in that position and then having over come it in some form of like extremely successful kind of like development project so that kind of like positioning on the kind of like the southern side of that you know kind of like binary opposition i think that is one of the things that that unites the global south 